Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I am honored to have Andrew Chubby Chandler with me. Andrew is a uh, was a professional golfer. He's also the founder of International Sports Management and uh, really represent a lot of top pro athletes. And I think one of the things you're going to hear in his story today is success in life often comes because of relationships and trust. And so uh, super excited to highlight his story. So Andrew, thanks so much for being on today. Mm, been called Andrew a bit recently. It's getting it's getting worried for about 30 years. Nobody called me anything but Joey. I was, uh, I was in hospital about four or five weeks ago with a gold stone. And I obviously had Andrew Chandler above my bed. And every nurse and every doctor came and said, how are you, Andrew? How are you, Andrew? <laughs> and he sort of looked over my shoulder to see if anybody else was here. <laughs> we'll go back to Chubby for today then. We'll call okay. you Chubby the rest of the day. That's good. Oh, I love it. So starting off in your life, I'd love to hear just a little bit about kind of how you started playing golf and then, you know, really you hit the scene and started having the opportunity or thinking, man, professionally it could happen in 1972 uh, when you won the British British Youth Open. So talk a little bit about, you know, getting started and then winning that big tournament. Well, I guess being born on April the 1st was a, an interesting <laughs> start to my life. And it's, it's, it's interesting because people remember your birthday when you're born on April the 1st. <laughs> you know, it's a bit like Christmas Day. And uh, I was... I enjoyed school. I was a, I was, I was one of those kids that I really enjoyed my junior school, and um, and I, uh, my best friend who sadly passed away last year, a guy called Paul Mariner, who actually coached and played soccer in the states. Eventually, he played for England, and um, he was New New England Revolution, and uh, he did a bit of ESPN stuff, and I played out with him every night for about five years. And and his, his I know his mum's birthday. They his mum's birthday is May the thirty first. <sighs> so I, we were pretty close. Yeah. And uh, you know I I had a ninth birthday party and it was a football party and there was fifteen kids running around in circles chasing one boy, and um, I can remember my dad saying right there and then this boy will play for England and he did. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know that was that was almost the first. First time I sort of looked at somebody and thought, well, they're a bit better than the rest. <laughs> and, and then obviously as I went through life, I've seen a lot of people better than the rest. And yeah. I uh, I started golf when I was 12. And I, I, I started like a lot of kids. I started caddying for my dad. Yeah. And I played a lot of that funny game called cricket. Yeah. And I discovered probably by about 14 that I could play golf on my own and I couldn't play cricket on my own. And, you know, needing, needing a bunch of friends, which I didn't have particularly to play cricket with every night. So I played golf and, and I got better and uh, I played, I went through school. I wanted to stay an extra year when I was 18 and a quarter, which mm. was unheard of. Yeah. But I had it so well organised that I could do this, do that. Didn't do a lot of schoolwork. Managed to play golf all the time. It, bizarrely played badminton. And, yeah. Uh, they wouldn't let me stay, so I became what was known as a full-time amateur. Mm. And I, I worked in the winter, saved all my pennies, and then my mum and dad obviously helped, gave me a lot of, sacrificed a lot of their lives for me. And uh, I played this full-time golf for three years till I was 21. And my last year as a full-time golfer in the winter, I was a full-time postman, an absolutely proper postman. <laughs> and I went to the interview, and I can remember the guy saying to me, you're very highly qualified for this. Yeah. And I said, no, I want to be Postmaster General, which is like the number one postman in the country. I love and, it. And I, and I used to take the post. I used to get up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock every morning, go and take the post. But I was finished at 10. Mm. And I used to go and play golf in the afternoons. And, and you know, that, that was how I got going. And then I turned pro in October 1974. And I yeah. packed my bags and I went off and I got a little bit of funding from a few friends at the golf club and whatever. And I went off to play in Venice at a golf course called the Lido for my very first golf tournament, which was the Italian Open. And the Ita and I missed out my amateur career because it doesn't really matter, but I played okay as an amateur. And I went to this uh, this Italian Open and there was a young boy, four years younger than me, called Severiano Ballesteros. 
who was also playing his very first event outside Spain, he and I's careers went off in different directions. <laughs> my, mine went one way and his went the other. I probably had more fun, but uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he was the, it was an incredible week for looking back on it that it was his first big week as well. Yes. And I played the year after I, I became a full-time European tour player and uh, had to pre-qualify on Mondays, and whatever, whatever. And I probably, the forerunner to my business in 89 was me trying to survive in 75. Yes. And I got, I got talked talk to a lot of people into sponsoring me. And I remember I had a, a guy called Jimmy Holt sponsored me for 8,000 quid in about 1976 or seven. And he had one of the very first motorized golf trolleys. Mm -hmm. Well, he was way before his time, but so was I. Cause you know, so the idea of having a logo on your bag was different and right. you know, eight, Eight grand right now. If I got eight grand for a young player right now, now he'd be pleased. Never mind right. forty years ago. So you know that that was that was obviously the first seeds of me being a bit commercially minded <clears throat> and a forerunner for for what I what I ended up doing. And my golf career was spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, you know, I struggled. Uh, it's hard to sort of say this, but I never figured out it was a job. Mm. You know, it was. He went away and, you know, the Irish, I remember going to the Portuguese Open and the, the famous Irish guys, you know, like Christy O'Connor Sr., Christy O'Connor Jr., Arnold O'Connor, Hugh Jackson, Ryder Cup players. And they, they had the squeeze box and they had the spoons and the night after the first round, they're all in the bar singing the White Rover. And, and, and it was like a boy's golf holiday. Yeah. I think it's a bit like live now, actually. Yeah. And, <laughs> And, and, you know, it's just like a boy's golf holiday. And and I don't think I ever really got it in my head that that was my living. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, let me just kill that. And uh, it was, um, it, it was interesting times, you know, and, and, and I was, I was blessed in, in the fact that my golf career covered Sandy Lyles, Ian Woosnams, Nick Faldo, Sebi's, Langers, you know, all the European greats that made the tour yeah. they made the european tour you know that they, they were the start of the european tour and and you know for me to sort of actually play with them and know them and you know sort of get on with them and i, I played i got to about 1984 a friend of mine bought a golf club called mia golf and country club and i practiced and played and, and, and I got back into, I, I sort of faded away in 83 and didn't really play five tournaments, but then started playing at this golf club and playing money games all the time. And I, you know, it's like the old Trevino story. You know, you play for a hundred dollars when you've only got 20 in your pocket, you make sure you play all right. And, and that was, that was definitely me. Yeah. You know, and, and my golf got to such a level that, that I went back to the tour school and got a, a really good card. Um, that year, bizarrely, Jeff Sluman was was the leading. Jeff Sluman and a guy called Robert Wren were the top two in the uh, European Tour School, and they never played a golf tournament in Europe from that card. But I, I got number seven card, and I played okay then in in eighty five. And then my father died in eighty five during the Irish Open, mm. and. You know, he, they, my mum and dad, like every mum and dad for any golfer, sacrificed so much. Yeah. And, you know, he, he, he died. And my mum said, you've got to play next week. Your dad will want, your dad will want you to play. He said, she said, we're having the funeral on Tuesday so you can try, fly out to Monaco and play the golf tournament. I mean, just incredible looking back on it. Yeah. And I, you know, and I played, I played okay then. And then at the end of that year, I won the, um, San Paolo Open, yes. which was my first tournament win and my last tournament win. Yes. It was, it was so, you know, that, that was the only proper four-round golf tournament I won. So I want to highlight two things just about what you kind of shared with that last story. And that is, you know, one, um, talking about the mental toughness of a golfer, right? I mean, what, what a sport. Uh, it's the one sport where it is truly you versus whatever it is in front of you, right? I mean, anything else? There's usually a competitor that, you know, you're having some obstacle against. But the second part is you had mentioned that 
playing in that tournament after your dad had passed on that Sunday. Um, I think you were in the toilet and you just all of a sudden felt like, man, today is going to be my day. So talk a little bit about that mental you, toughness piece you as have well. Done, you have done your research. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, well, that's that's totally true what you say. You know, I was, I was there in Brazil and there were four of us that had got this. There was a big, tall American called John Jacobs who was a big, tall, good-looking guy, and he played the European Tour, and he yeah. said, I've got a deal for four of you to come and play in Brazil. Hmm. Well, I'd never, I've been never offered a deal <laughs> like that before, so <laughs> I've got a free business class air ticket, my hotel's paid, and they gave me $1,500. I thought, this is another holiday. <laughs> and, it, and it was nearly. But I won the golf tournament, and I won $15,000. And and like I said to you, uh, you said to me there, that there's no doubt that morning I, I, uh, I sort of felt different and I felt my father was around and he died three months before mm. and um, I went out and the only I just kept saying to myself over the ball every shot this is going to be your day this is going to yeah. be your day now in hindsight I mean listen to every golf psychologist that that Darren Clark ever used which was about 15 of them what I'd done was put my brain in neutral Mm. I was absolutely neutral. And, you know, you can't, if you have a little line like that, you can't suddenly think in the middle of it or don't hit it out of bounds. Right. Because that's what you have to sort of creep in, things like that. But I'm just saying, no, this is going to be your day. This is going to be your day. And and I, it was my day. It was, <laughs> it was my only day. So, you know, thinking about that and talking through that, and we'll get to a point in time where you're representing golfers, but just talk a little bit about the, you know, the psychology in golf. I mean, man, you know, to hit one shot and then, you know, what, a minute later you have to, whether it was a great shot or a terrible shot, you have to get your mind right and be able to hit again. And I think, once again, you talked about things that separate golfers, right? I mean, that is one of them, uh, you know, yeah. that mental piece, being able to stay straight and narrow and say, all right, yep, that one sucked, but guess what? Here's the correction I need to make so I can keep going. So talk a little bit about the, just that mental part as a professional golfer. Well, there's, there's, there's two parts to it. Okay. There's that part that you're on your own on the golf course yeah. and you've got to stay focused. And, you know, the, the biggest thing I would say to any young boy would be you've got to learn to concentrate. Mm. These guys concentrate so well. And they concentrate. They might, some might turn it on and off. Mm. Others might stay in the moment the whole five hours, like yeah. Patrick Canley, five and a half hours with Patrick Canley. Yeah. And you know, the, and then you get other guys that will switch on and off. But they, they all manage to get in the right state to hit the right golf shot. But there's there's also the off the course bit because golf's an unbelievably lonely place. Yeah, you know what I mean. You go back to you can go back to your room having missed the cut by one on a Friday at about nine o'clock. And by nine o'clock next morning, the world's collapsed. Yep. And there is no future and whatever. Because you've been on your own in that room, going through what's happened on the previous two days, going through the fact that you're number 124 in the money list. And if I don't finish top 125, I have no job. And you know what I mean? You can build it up so much. So there's, there's two levels of concentration. Yeah. It's the off-course bit and the on-course bit. And they're both, they're both difficult. You know, I've, I've had so much experience to talking to golf pros where they've been on their own in a room. You know, I've, I've gone to rooms where guys have locked themselves in and they're crying. You yeah. know, and, and, and I'm serious. That's not a flippant remark. Yeah. They're absolutely on the edge of a breakdown all the time. So it's, it's, a, it's a much more difficult sport than people imagine because yeah. we sit and watch the TV. Like I, I, Sunday night, bizarrely, was the first night I've watched a full night of TV on golf for a long time, apart from the Masters and the Ryder Cup. Yeah. And I was I watched for four hours on uh, on on Sunday night, partly because I used to manage Matt Fitzpatrick, yeah. partly because I nearly managed Jordan Spieth, and partly because I wondered how long Patrick Cantley was going to take. But it was, it was a really interesting watch. And golf, golf's gone through, as you know, I know, and everybody knows, he's going, going through and has gone through an unbelievable... 18 months yes and there's quite a lot of good come out of it mm. you know that it's it, it, people are focusing on the bad stuff it's actually 
I mean, they managed to concoct so many good finishes on the PGA Tour this year. It almost looks as though they've said, listen, make sure these are exciting. Yeah, right. I'm sure the, golf, sure the golf's been better this year than, than it's been before. And the other thing, they've made this rule where everybody has to play apart from Rory, that, that they have to play every week. And yeah. so you've got the top players beating the top players every week. So it's, it's unbelievably exciting. And then you've got got these guys that you've never heard of come in, but they never quite get there. They stay on the fringe, but they never yeah. quite get there. But I think golf, in a funny sort of way, is in a fantastic place right now. Yes. So, and one thing I just want, you know, the listeners to hear uh, on the mental side of what you're talking about is, you know, not everyone can relate to being a professional golfer or even being good at golf or wanting to be good at golf. But, you know, you just talked about how as you're going through life, oftentimes we can start extrapolating things, right? And creating this new narrative, this new story way out in the future based on one small thing that happened today. And it's like, you know what, that that's not necessarily the case unless you allow that to be the case, right? But if you make decisions that can allow that narrative to change, then you don't have to worry about that. So make sure that, yeah, you're keeping tabs on the emotional side and not sending it into a spiral and then allowing your actions to follow that. So that's good. Yeah. I love it. And you've got, you, I mean, a favorite thing with golf psychologists would be, you know, control the controllables. Yes. Because, and in everyday life, we all worry about things that we shouldn't be worrying about. You yep. know, I mean, you know, you, you, if you break things down and you think something you're stressed out about, you think, well, there's actually nothing I can do about that. <laughs> so why am I worrying about it? You know, it's, it's, and, and I try and sort of get that into my kids that, you know, just think about, Number one, don't fear failure. Mm, yes, because because the younger generation think that everybody's got a Ferrari and everybody's making millions and whatever, but they don't realize that everybody's had a go at doing it. And and you know the most successful people have all gone bang, bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And and you know you've got to you've got to have a go. If you don't have a go, you won't get anywhere. And I it's, love it. it. It's it's really it's really difficult to get through to. Yes. Now, you mentioned, you know, during the golf career, you were doing things differently than others were. And, you know, a few years back, it wasn't necessarily these big, you know, BMW contracts, you know, and things like that, that players were getting. So you had to go out and kind of promote yourself. Well, inevitably, as you were on the tour and you were creating relationships, there were a few gentlemen uh, that said, hey, Chubby, you're doing this for yourself. Maybe you could start helping us get cheaper air flights and finding the more cost-effective hotel. No, it, it wasn't it wasn't quite like that. No. I, I was, I'd done I'd done it for some guys I played with. Yeah. So I, I was fixing a hotel deal or maybe getting a cheap hire car or maybe this, that, and the other. But I got to the stage in nineteen eighty nine where I wasn't I wasn't improving as quick as everybody else. Because mm -hmm. people, you know, people were turning up with dietitians and people like coaches and things like. I never had a coach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were all turning up with these things, and I'm thought I'm not gonna, I'm not improving as quick. And I thought I ain't gonna be a club pro. I'm not gonna sell TPEX. I'm not gonna do this. And I thought I had this wonderful idea that I was gonna be good at PR, but I didn't even know what PR stood for. You know yeah. what I mean? And I, seriously, <laughs> I didn't know that was public relations. I had no yeah. idea what. It was. And I. I actually, uh, the guy that owned my golf club, me, that, that got me into the gambling games or whatever, was a very, very good businessman. Yeah. But went bust two or three times and, you know, did, did all the things every successful person does. And he, my idea to set up international sports management was to keep 50% and sell 10 lots of 5%, just like a golf sponsorship. Yeah. And he said to me, no, 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 you don't do that. He said, You've got a good story. You've got this, that, and the other. Go to the the small loans place at Nat West Bank. Tell them your story and see if you, what you can get. And I got a ten grand overdraft. Yes. And and that's how it started. Yes. And Stephen Bowler, who gave me the advice, then proceeded to charge me five grand a year rent to have my office in the thing. Now I look <laughs> back. And think, how have I managed to borrow 10 grand and pay five grand rent? You know, it, it didn't make any sense, but I didn't know about cash flow and things like that. It was, it was, it was interesting. Yes. It was interesting. So <clears throat> there were 
there was a uh, tournament in South Africa uh, with the ICI, and you negotiated for two players to get logos. So talk a little bit about, once again, hey, I've done this for myself. We heard that story earlier, but now I'm going to do it for others. You have done research, haven't you? <laughs> I, I, um, I did some work for ICI, corporate golf down there, and we needed to get another person, so I got a guy called John Bland, and he then ended up getting a, a full sponsorship. I got, I wasn't sponsored by them. I just got, kept getting paid for doing all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then this friend of mine who was from Manchester but worked, headed up South Africa, he came back home and headed up ICI Colours, a guy called Mike Parker. And he had a load of Japanese customers, big mm -hmm. customers, film film people, Fuji and all yeah. of that. Said, I want to do the same thing we did in South Africa on the European tour. And I said, Well, I'm I'm nearly at the end of my 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 term. But I said, I'll find you two players and I'll run the program for you. And that was the start. And I, I got two I got the two players guy called Phil Harrison and a guy called uh, Carl Mason. And Phil Harrison is actually now the commissioner of the um, Legends Tour that I run a tournament for. Wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. And we, we cut a lot of middle people out. <laughs> he rings me and I ring him and we get it sorted. But he, we set that up and um, we entertain these Japanese. And one of, one of the things that I'll always remember, we... They give us 1992, Carl Mason with the ICI logo and won the Scottish Open. And we had 20 Japanese clients and we were staying in a nice place and we were playing Glen Eagles the day after the tournament. The tournament finished on a Saturday then, not a Sunday. And it finished on the Saturday and we were playing golf on the Sunday. We were having dinner with the pros, with the clients on the Sunday, uh, Saturday night. And we went to the, the dinner and we got this private room in a a pub called the Tomilkin, Tomilkin Inn. And we walked in, Carl and I walked in, the other guy had missed the cup, but come back for it. And we walked in and he got a standing ovation from all these little Japanese guys clapping away. And and it was unbelievable. And he thought, this is this is how a gold star shit's supposed to work. Yeah. And uh, and it was it was it was one of those memories I'll never forget the the respect the Japanese people show everybody. Mm. And then, you know, that they had somebody that had just won the golf tournament in front of their very eyes coming down and dinner with them that night. Yes. So it was amazing. I love it. Now, in 1990, you get a phone call about a young person that's uh, pretty good, but you wanted to see, all right, how good is this individual? So talk about the beginning of the relationship between you nearly. and Derek. Nearly, <laughs> nearly. He was better than pretty good. <laughs> And I was told that there was a young guy in Ireland that wanted to talk to me about whether he should talk, turn professional. It wasn't about management then. Yes. It, was, it was about whether he should turn. And I met this very young, um, he had blonde tits in his hair. He had a cashmere overcoat on in August, a boss cashmere overcoat. And he met me and his name was Darren Clark. And we talked for an hour about the advantages and disadvantages of turning pro then. And and I was honest, I'm I'm pretty straight up and down. So I just said, I said, you know, if you if you stay an amateur for another year, you won't get any more invites, your contracts won't be any bigger, you know, and, and the Walker Cup the year after was was in Ireland. Mm. And he um, you know, he's listening and this, that and the other. And he said, Okay, I just want to play golf. Could you yeah. do everything else? Yeah. And I wasn't going to say no. You know, it wasn't a case of shall I think about this or shall I do this, that, no. I said, yeah, I can do everything else. And <clears throat> that's how it stayed until about three years ago. You know, we, I just did everything for him because yeah. he just wanted to play golf. And yeah. it was the most exciting ride you could have. I mean, because... There's no dull days with Darren Clark. You know, there's, there's, there's bad days and good days, but there's not many average days. Yeah. And uh, he, he, he would actually not take this the wrong way, but he was an underperformer to win one major in 20 golf tournaments. Mm, he, yeah. he could have, he could have, he was a, he's a complex lad and he worked his 
he worked his ass off, but it, it wasn't always quality work. You know, he, he just battered balls and battered balls thinking that was the secret. But, you know, in hindsight, it needed to be more quality. But it was it was amazing. And I played golf. He came over to my office the following week after he won the Irish Amateur, which I was told he was going to win. Yeah. And uh, he came over and he played. And I only I was only intimidated on a golf course as a pro once, properly. And it was Sandy Lyle. Mm. And Sandy Lyle had the capability of having a big cloth waterproof on, unzipped, throw a ball on the ground, hit a one iron past my best drive. <laughs> and, and it was it was absolutely awful intimidation when he could do that. And I played then the week after I met Darren, I played with Darren at my golf club and he was hitting those days two hundred and ten yards was a long way for a three iron. Yeah. And he kept it in the air and it came down soft. And I thought, my company's got a future here. Yeah. You know, that 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 really was it. I looked and I thought, I got a future. This is this is gonna be fun. And and I was very lucky that he let me get so close to everything in his career. Yep. And when Lee Westwood came along, exactly the same. Yes. You know, I was privileged to to be a part of what they were doing. And I, I got invited to the Masters in 1992 by Ronan Rafferty, who won the money list in Europe, yeah. for no reason apart from he wanted to help me. And I yeah. said, Ronan, with respect, I'm going to wait until one of my guys get there. Well, mm. that was pretty far-fetched at that stage because they were, you know, Lee, Lee was about two years from turning pro and Darren was just turned pro. And, uh, and I went to my first Masters with Lee Westwood, his first Masters. I went to my first Ryder Cup with the two of them in 1997 to Valderrama. And, you know, I lived an unbelievably charmed life with, with those two. And we just had great times. I got treated incredibly well wherever we went. And, uh, you know, I even got used to getting on a private plane now and again. So uh, as this business continues, you mentioned, you know, working with Lee West, but there's others that we'll get to. But, you know, the most important piece of what you're doing there is one, representing them well, but having that trust factor. And a as the legend goes, you wanted to do a handshake deal on things and just say, hey, we don't need a contract for this. We're, you know, just be people of that, integrity. We'll shake our hands. So that was, you know, that was part of the Darren Clark story. Yes. Because during with Darren, he said, what should we, when we, we were with a lawyer, we actually were introduced by a lawyer called Dougie Heather. And he looked at me, he said, what are we going to do about a contract? And I said, well, Mark McCormack and Arnold Palmer never had a contract. They just shook hands and got on with it. He said, right, that's what we're going to do. And that's what we did. We never had a piece of paper between us. Yes. Now, I, I think, you know, one, you could probably say it across time. That's a very abnormal thing to do. But especially in, you know, today's world, people would say that's abnormal. And I think one of the important things to understand there is, you know, hey, if you're treating people well and you have their best intention at heart, things typically work out pretty well for both sides of the deal. Um, but there's also the <laughs> element that there's other people that are going to come compete against Chubby for these athletes, especially as they start performing really well. So talk a little bit about, you know, treating people well and, you know, what you did to kind of reinforce those relationships and make sure they were strong. Well, they, they, that, that was the problem in the end, that, that it became so well known we didn't have any contracts that every management company in the world right. saw us as a fodder. And, and to be honest, you know, sort of had had numerous players taken from under my nose and out of my care because of that. Because, you know, you can you can paint a very good picture if you're an agent. And mm -hmm. and, and I, had, I had huge trouble trying to get an American to sign with us, you know, because all the American agents just said, well, Chubby wants you to play in Europe. Well, I didn't. I wanted to have a business in America. That was yeah, right. all I did. You know, Jordan Spieth, was, Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas were very close to signing. Yeah. And, you know, in the end, the guys were saying, oh, no, no, Chubby just wants you to play in Europe. And, and that's, that was enough to put guys off. Well, Justin Thomas was put off because Tiger run. Mm. On the Sunday after, they were making a decision that weekend. The Tiger on that evening said, if he signs with my guys, he said, I'll look after him. And fair play to Tiger. He's yeah, right. 
Yeah. He's looked after Justin Thomas since then. Oh, that's yeah. great. Now, you also eventually end up um, representing Ernie Els, um, Roy McElroy for a while. So talk a little bit about just how some of those relationships came to be and uh, how you had the opportunity to sign them. Well, Rory, Rory was interesting because I, I knew Rory from 13 years old. And Rory uh, was on Darren, – Darren had a foundation and he had a weekend every year where he had the best age group golfers in Ireland come to – to play with him, to be coached by him, to have tips, to have a chat, whatever. And Rory came at 13 and he was probably four foot nine. And he was, he was, he was, a, I think a three handicap then. He was, he was a very good player. Yeah. But boy, was he a cocky, energetic kid. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he was, he was life and soul of it. And there yeah. were 17, 18 year olds. But he was, the, he was the man, you know, he knew. So I knew I knew him for a long time before he turned pro, and I sort of tried to help his dad because his dad got very stressed out because they had something like ninety colleges trying to sign Rory up, mm. and they had agents coming at him left, right, and centre, and everything. And I remember saying to Jerry, I said, "Listen, maybe it's easier to just tell people that he's not going to turn pro, he's, he's not going to go to college, he's going to turn pro, he's going to sign with Chubby, blah blah blah." And I said that might just get the heat off you a bit, and it did. Because he, yeah. he was very stressed out by, you know, all these co- all the top colleges in America wanted to sign him when he was 16. Yep. And uh, he, was the, he was the easiest guy to turn pro that I handled because, number one, he was so good. Yeah. Getting money for him and sponsorship for him was, was, was easy, you know. Yeah. I mean, his, his deals from the day he turned pro. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. And number two... I knew when it was going to be. I knew the date was going to be about 12 months before it happened. Yeah. Because we ran the British Masters. And so it was obvious it was about the middle of September. So he was going to turn pro at the British Masters after the Walker Cup. He was going to turn up on the Tuesday and we we're going to go, Ta-da, this is Rory McElroy. And it was, it was, it was amazingly straightforward because, you know, his, his first deal for his hat was four hundred grand and things like that. You know, it was it was amazing. And he decided in July before he turned pro that he was going to buy a house. He had no earnings. He yeah. was an amateur golfer. He was seventeen, and he just said, "Can I buy a house, Chubby?" <laughs> and I, 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 it was odd question, you know. And then I thought, well, yeah, you you got guaranteed earnings. You know, I know what you're going to get. Yeah. So I said, yeah. He bought a house when he was 17 with no earnings for 600 grand. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. Now, now, as players are, you know, progressing in their careers, once again, um, you know, notoriety changes and the way that maybe they even feel the need to be cared for can change. And one of the things that you talked about was, you know, you always try to make it about the person. And there were golfers that would have a great day and a bad day in the same day that you were with them. And you'd say, well, I'm going to acknowledge the good player because obviously they did really good. But the person that probably needs me more is the player that didn't play as well. So talk a little bit about that balancing act for you even, you know, and not getting caught up and just wanting to go celebrate the winner because, well, gosh, that's going to be a heck of a lot more fun party than, you know, the person that maybe missed the cut or, you know, didn't play as well as they thought they could have. I think uh, 2011 Masters, I think that's the right year. Yeah. But it was the year that Rory imploded on the back nine and shot 46, I think, for the back nine. And Shell Swartz all won. Yeah. So I got a client that won and I got a client that's in bits because he, he didn't win. Yeah. And and that was that was an extreme case of what you just said there, that you're juggling two lo- separate lots of emotion. Yeah. And next morning, they were both flying together privately up to New York to then go and play in Malaysia. And Chatty, Rory turned up and Shal had his blazer on. He had his green jacket on. I mean, and I and Rory was fine about it, but boy, yeah. I was I was uncomfortable. Eh? Yeah. I thought, oh, this this is too difficult. But, you know, when, when you've won the Masters, you don't want to take that jacket right. off for a while. Yeah, I can imagine that that would uh, you probably sleep in that, you do everything in that. Yeah, yeah, they gave they give you they give you a little lecture when you've won. You go to the it's not the Buffalo cabin, it's one of the other cabins. And you go there, and there was there was Billy Payne who was the chairman then, and uh, 
two or three other green jackets and, and you're allowed to take your caddy and you're allowed to take your family and a couple of friends and the caddy can take a couple of friends. And you've got this little little drink and and, he, and he's got the jacket on from being presented it in the Buzzler cabin, yeah. but then he has to take it off for the presentation. And the, Billy Payne's sister, he said, he said, right, there's three things you've got to remember. He said, you don't let anybody else wear this jacket. <laughs> You don't wear any sponsored logos or hats with the jacket on. And you never, ever, what's the third one? Never wear it with blue jeans. <laughs> they, were the, they were the three rules. And then he said, and for a year, we're really happy that you take it any way you want to and you wear it. And, and it's amazing how often they take the green jacket and wear it for a dinner. Yeah. And it's really cool. Yeah, you know, people come up. People come up and touch you, and right. you know, just what does it feel like that grad jacket? I mean, it really does create an unbelievable impression. And uh, they're, they're the rules. And then you then you go and get presented publicly, and then you end up doing a, a few interviews, and then you end up going to a dinner with the members. And all this time, Rory's back at home. Right. You know, it's like you just see both ends of it. It was it was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Now, for you, um, you know, there was many times where you had one of your players that was winning one of the major tournaments and almost all of them within one year. Um, and, you know, I, I can't imagine that there's a lot of, you know, agents, people that were right looking after people that ever had that. So talk about just the neat factor of, man, we're representing some of the best in the world because when we look at the top you know, list of tournaments, we're getting the winner at most of these. Well, we won four out of five. Yeah. In a run there. I mean, yeah. that was that was amazing. And, you know, in, in hindsight, looking back, things were happening so fast for me because it, it was it was me. You know, I was I was doing just about everything. You know, I had people working for me, but but I had, you know, sort of all all the sponsorship and stuff like that I was getting in. I had no salespeople really until about then, that's yeah. that's when it happened. And, you know, in hindsight now, it, it's a shame because you almost don't relish the moments. Mm. You don't have time to. Uh, you know, it's all a bit of a whirl. And often it's a drunken whirl. Yeah, right. You know, it's, it's, you normally, I remember going to, uh, when Rory won the US Open, we had to go from wherever it was, Southern Hills, was it? Uh, no, Congressional. Okay, Went yeah. Congressional to uh, Connecticut for a golf day for Odomar Piguet, the watch people. And I mean, how we got on the plane, I've no idea, because Rory <laughs> had plenty, I had plenty. And the boss of Odomar Piguet gave me a watch for getting him there. Just actually <laughs> physically getting him there. And just... uh, it, it's, you know, that that's the trouble. You know, my, my, my job starts immediately, they finished, and right. suddenly you're in this world of emotion and success and and booze and whatever and and yet that's when you that's when you're clicking on and working that's what you've got to make sure he's got that interview and you want to make sure and now it's even worse because you've got social media that's cranked up as well yeah but it's you know you wouldn't swap it for anything but uh, i do think sometimes that i didn't i didn't reflect on it enough at the time and, mm. and it didn't you know you sort of it happens and you just don't realize what's happening to you Yes, I love you that. Yes. Now, something that you've mentioned a few times today, and I, I think it's so interesting because it's a transferable thought. Uh, there's a book called The One Thing. And the premise is, you know, you should really focus on that one thing that you're really good at, opposed to trying to be mediocrely good at nine different things. And, you know, as I heard you talk about different players that you represent, Shelby, I don't, I don't want to have to worry about marketing. I don't want to have to worry about my negotiations. I just want to play golf, right? And I think when your attention and attention to detail and focus is on that singular thing, it can allow you to really excel at that because otherwise, maybe instead of being able to practice or, you know, work on your golf game for six hours a day, you can only do three hours a day because you have these other meetings you have to attend. Or maybe from a stress standpoint, you're much more stressed out because these other things you really don't like to do are taking up your time. And then that translates into how you're performing on the on the course. So talk a little bit about that, you know, focusing on that one thing, the one thing that you're able to do uniquely well and kind of delegating the rest. Yeah, I think um, 
I think any golfer that tries to do all the the outside bits and 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 there's an unbelievable case right now, Rory. Yeah. I mean, Rory's Rory's the Pied Piper of the PGA Tour. Yeah. And and you know, I, I'm sure he's wearing an earpiece down the the ninth fairway at Augusta because he is that role model for this is what we're doing. But I think I I think it's probably too much for him, and I think you know, sort of, it is. I was going to say it's tough for him. It's tough for him to compete the way he wants to compete, but I'm not so sure that he's um, as. How do I put this? I'm not so sure he's as hurt by his performances as he used to be because yeah. he's got a lovely wife, he's got a great mum and dad, he's got a great, nice family, he's got all the money that. Ireland could wish for, never mind Rory could wish for. Yeah. And, you know, so I think some of the media stuff that puts pressure on him is probably unfounded because he's really not in a bad place. Right. You know, I, don't, I don't think, even when he doesn't win Augusta, which obviously he wants to, I'm not so sure it's the end of the world when he doesn't. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that he's, he, he's a point in kind where you say, you know, you need to concentrate on that one thing. Mm. Well, I think he's his attention has been diverted. Yeah. And I think Jay Monaghan's put probably too much on him. Yeah. But it's up to him to say no, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. We've all got a choice, haven't we? We've usually yes. got a choice to say yes or no. And sometimes it's hard to say no, but I think Rory a couple of times probably could have said no to some of the stuff that had to had him trying to do. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a really interesting point you make. You know, you think about what motivates people, right? And depending on the phase and season of your life, it, it that can change. And so, you know, early on, a person might say, gosh, I'm not married. I don't have kids. Like my sole motivation is just becoming successful in golf. And then all of a sudden, um, and you can see that kind of deviate for different people, right? You hear the, I don't know if you've watched the, uh, Netflix documentary, the, uh, the last dance with Michael Jordan. Uh, but you know, I mean, you just see the guy's level of com competition. It wasn't about getting relationships with any of these other players or teammates. It was about being the best basketball player in the world. And that was his one thing. Whereas there were other players that were like, yeah, I mean, I wanted to be really good, but like, you know, I wanted to make sure my wife and my kids were taken care of and that, you know, I had a good relationship with them. So if it meant I had to sacrifice a little basketball, then I would do that. And so it's interesting to see how that can change over a person's life as well. Yeah, I think uh, I've, I I don't read books. I listen to books. Yeah. I listened to two very long uh, Michael Jordan books just recently. Yeah. And I think he's amazing. I think the stuff he did was amazing. And I would have loved to have been interested in basketball in the 90s because I am now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because when he was very good, I really didn't realise it. And I remember asking Darren when he was, I don't know, 23 or 4, I said, who's your, who's your idol as a sportsman? He said, Michael Jordan. I thought, Michael Jordan? He's a basketball player. <laughs> but uh, the story's very good. And everybody's different, aren't they? I mean, you, you've got somebody like John Rahm. I think, he's, I think he's an unbelievably good example at the moment of the professional golf. Yeah. And he... He, when he says something, he means it, and he doesn't really mind saying what he thinks. He doesn't yeah. do it for the benefit of anybody else. But I think, you know, so the, the top sportsmen, the scrutiny they're under now yeah. is unbelievable. And, you know, we, we haven't talked about Liv yet. I was just saying, we're going... You know, you see, you see these guys sign up for a lot of cash, and, and some of them, you understand why. I mean, yeah. Brooks Kepka, his body was broken. Yep. So if somebody puts $100 million on the table in front of you and you've got a slightly suspect body that might not, not manage for the next 15 years, you're going to take it. Absolutely. I think I think Live Golf is interesting. I don't think they've quite got the format right, but I think they could have introduced maybe a, a champion store player and a lady to the teams or something like that. It's it's a little bit, bit like a boys' golf holiday, like I said. Yeah. And, um, you know, people like Mickelson, yeah, you know that, that's an awful lot of money, and whether he's good at gambling or bad at gambling, it's a lot of money. And right. you know, you, you can't Lee Westwood. You know, twenty five million at his stage—that's a lot of cash. So, yeah. you want? I understand why they've all done it. 
And I, I, what I do think is that the younger guys that did it late on, like um, Cam Smith, mm. all this extra money on the PJ Tour, I would think Cam Smith's probably reflecting thought, mm, it was a good deal, but it wasn't that good because I would have made, I'd have made 40 million a year playing the PJ Tour. Yeah. But, you know, everybody's got decisions to make. And the one thing that, that the live thing's done is brought golf to the fore. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, the Masters was made by the rivalry with the live players and the PJ <laughs> Tour players. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And, and, you know, I can see the day when, if it all settles down, you'll have Live versus PJ Tour. The uh-huh. Ryder Cup will be nowhere. Yeah. So what do you think what do you think caused it to take this long to get, you know, that challenging force? I mean, do you think it was purely someone that would step up that had the money, or what do you think caused I think it I think it was that. I think there's yeah. there's a lot to do with the fact that the Saudis have got an oil well to throw at it. Yeah. And it needed somebody like Phil and Greg to stand up and be counted, not saying, not saying they were completely right, but and Greg's been ridiculously outspoken. But they needed somebody that did that, else it wouldn't have taken off. Yep. You know, it, 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 I'm not sure I would have a strong enough character or a thick enough skin to do what he was doing, and certainly not famous enough to make yeah. a difference. And you know, he's he's done a good job. He probably needs to step aside soon. Yep. But but he's done his bit, you know. Even to the point of telling everybody there'd be a party for Live Player on the 18th green. I mean, it was a great line that. You know, I yes. didn't see all the jets. Didn't see all the jets circling on Sunday. We've been coming back to watch so. <laughs> but it's the, uh, you know, I think in in sport you need new new things new, and there's no doubt golf, myself included, was lazy with the product, because the product stayed the same for so long. Right. And, and you know, I actually realised it. You know, we, I tried to get a couple of things off the ground, and we did a golf tournament in um, Cyprus about three years ago where the PGA Tour got us to do two back-to-back. Yeah. And the second week was a very different format because I just wanted to do something different. And, you know, we started off with a full field, and 32 guys made the cut, and they started again, and it was a reset. And they played on the Saturday, and it was a reset for Sunday. Mm. And the commission of the European Tour, um, Keith Pelly, he he rung me up on the Sunday and said, "Unbelievable what you did! You made Saturday exciting. I've never seen a Saturday exciting in the golf." Mm. And it was because they were all trying to trying to make the cut, then to be tied for the lead on the Sunday. Right. So the, the golf could have helped itself a little bit, but the Saudis have come in and. They had this big checkbook, and it was it was amazing. You know, I went to a couple of the tournaments in Saudi where all these agents turned up with their briefcase and everything. You'd, you'd see a huddle there, and then you'd see a huddle there, and you'd think, I wonder how much he's getting. So it was, it was interesting. It yeah. Was interesting. Well, I was going to say, so I'm sure you were privy to some of the behind the scenes, you know, hey, here's who's getting talked to. And, I mean, it just seemed like this – weird domino of people you know you're like who's it gonna be next uh you know it's so interesting and you'd hear murmurs and then they would you know be up getting interviewed and they'd say oh no that's never gonna happen and then two days later they were signing right so i guess talk a little bit about just the behind the scenes what you were privy to and uh, able to see as that live and pga but, were there but if you see now what's happened because of the pga tour suddenly finding the huge amounts of money they've found that yeah. that phil's that phil said they had yeah you know, I mean, he was dead right what he said. He, he, a lot of the stuff he said made a lot of sense in hindsight. Right. And, you know, they, they put all this extra money in. And you think, well, why didn't they put that in before? Right. You know, why have they been working on that? And I think, you know, to a certain degree, Mickelson was dead right. And I think it's very um, pertinent that nobody seems to have joined Live for about three months. And that's because the PJ Tour now is so big right. that that guys don't need to. You know, Matt Fitzpatrick, I don't know how much they'd have to pay him, but, but he's going to be a cash machine for the next 10 years. Right. And, and if he's going to be a cash machine for the next 10 years, how much, he's going to make 25, 30 million on course. And then, of course, he gets lots more. Yeah. Well, the live players don't get anything off course apart from 
what the, the live people get because they have all the logos. Right. They don't have any more logos. Any any live player with a logo on, he's not run out of that contract yet. But when they've got run out of the Nike contract or the Callaway contract or whatever it is, then that becomes all live. And it was very obvious that a few of them had all their live logos on. For Mickelson did. Um Kepkid didn't because his Nike contract is still carrying on. Um, Mickelson did. So, you know, you've got, you've, or Reed did. Yeah. So, you know, you've got had a few that were fully lived up and then you've got ones that hadn't because their contracts are not finished. But if you add together what somebody like Fitz will make off course plus the on course, they would have to pay him now two or three hundred million. Yep. And, and, you know, they can't do it. They can't just keep signing players up for 300 million. Right, right. Even, even their business model doesn't work for that. Right. So the, the question I have is, do you think it's viable that these two different paths continue on? Or do you think now that the PGA has made the change that you'll see more players wanting to stick in the more PGA type of a world that, uh, you know, hey, I don't feel as compelled to go leave to, to live now that PGA is, you know, thrown out some of those extra funds. I think there's a few things to think about. I think that the Masters was so good because the live players were allowed to play. Yeah. <clears throat> I think somehow the world ranking people or somebody similar that makes a world ranking that makes sense because the one the one we've got right now don't make any sense because, you know, that all the best players aren't in it. Yeah. So, you know, somebody's got to work that out because what's going to be fantastic are they going to be the majors because every time, the only time everybody's going to get together is four times a year, which just makes the majors bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. Who would have ever thought that the USPGA would become such a huge tournament because 20 years ago, nobody was particularly bothered about the PGA. Yeah. You know, it was one of those where they played it because it was a major and whatever, but... It was it was it was nothing like it's going to be now, but it, it's you know people can't wait for whatever it is three weeks time or four weeks time for the, another major where there's this storyline with these uh, these these subterfuge people coming in, you know, the the underground yes. people to play, and I think that it it could have been worked out. There's no doubt it could have been worked out. There could have been you could have had the PJ tour run into the end of August and then. Then the hybrid tour of the all the live stuff and huge tournaments going on around the world um, with the live money, but that that's not happened. No, they they were all they all had such a big ego that they yeah. didn't want to get they didn't want to get it together, did they? they yeah. You know the, the the live people wanted to to sort of batter the PGA tour and the PGA tour didn't want to sort of talk to the live people, so you ended up where we are. But I think eventually something there's got to be some form of hybrid tour. I think. Yes. But who knows? Uh, who knows? That's half the fun, isn't it? Yeah, that is. It half, is the, half the fun. Half the fun, still nobody has a clue what's going to happen because, you know, the, for, for as much as the live want to do this, that and the other, they're not going to be able to do everything they want to do. And the PJ Tour aren't going to be able to do everything they want to do. Yep. But it'd be a shame. It'd be a shame if they can't work a way that the best live players can get in the majors. Right. Because, you know, you wouldn't want... You wouldn't want the the tournament going on, you know, the USPJ going on without Cam Smith and Brooks and whatever in it. That's that wouldn't be right. Yep, agreed. Well, Shelby, I want to say thanks so much for you hopping on, highlighting your story. I mean, are there any other pivotal moments that we didn't talk about that just kind of stick out to you? you want to make sure to highlight? Yeah, pro probably about six hours worth, but we haven't got time. <laughs> Well, that just means we'll have to do this again. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, do, we'll I'll do it again. Yeah, what is scheduled out. Research it like you have is uh, <laughs> you, you did it. I did say to Carrie, I said, just make sure you research it. I've, I've packed two of these in after five minutes. Yeah, if, I, if, I if, can if, understand that. <laughs> well, if you're talking to somebody that has no idea what's gone on in somebody's life, it, 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 just, it just isn't any good. Yes. Oh, well, Shelby, thank you so much, my man. It's a pleasure. And you can have me again anytime. Oh, I most certainly will. I most certainly will. Oh.